Agriculture is in the newspapers every day this now, and it's a enormously exciting, but also an enormously uh, dangerous time. Um, for the first time since I remember, uh, it seems like supply and demand are fundamentally running apart. Demand has been growing exponentially now with more and more people, people getting more affluent and therefore wanting to eat higher value crops, meats, dairy, and that takes a lot of calories to produce. Supply is experiencing more and more constraints with water shortages, soil erosion, and a reduction in the underlying yield. And we put those two together and you get these price spikes and all the social and political unrest that comes with that. Uh, we have seen an interesting trend on the supply side where global productivity uh, decade after decade has been going down. Uh, we started with over 3% in the 60s uh, and now we're down to 1 to 1.5% annual increase in productivity. At the same time, global demand is increasing quite dramatically. Well, Africa is going to be really central to resolving this conundrum we have. And there's three or four ways we're going to work our ways through this. The solutions are, one, just getting small farmers more productive. And the yields in Africa and Asia are a half, a third, sometimes even less of what the yields in the West are. And we know how to bridge that gap. It's seed, it's fertilizer, it's some farming practices. So the first step is just to get small farmers more productive. Another part of the solution is to get more land into cultivation. There's still a lot of arable land which is available. Some of it has big environmental costs to it, and it's deforestation, the Amazon, that, and the whole world understands that that's not on the table for as part of the solution. But there's lots of land which is not like that, where there's been farming in the past and it's degraded, or there's relatively low environmental costs, but you have other costs. You've got social costs, there's oftentimes people who are, who are uh, informally living there or grazing their cattle there. I'm probably more optimistic about agriculture in Africa than I've ever been. I think we're seeing a number of encouraging factors coming from the continent. Countries going in the right direction and growing their economy substantially, and equally importantly also starting to make improvements on the agricultural um, production side. We seem to have some fairly stable democracies um, with increasing uh, uh, domestic production. Ghana's going to make the breadbasket work partly through getting small holders much more productive. And what the Ghanaian plan is, is to get a aggregator called warehouse aggregator. They have analyzed the value chains and said what's missing is a person, a private sector business that has a silo. And when people f harvest their crop, they can come and store it. And if you had a warehouse system like you have in most parts of the West, Farmers could come and say, I'll store it, I'll have a receipt, and I might be able to sell it three months later when prices are higher. The other nice thing about the aggregator is the ability for that aggregator to deal with a bank. A bank will loan money to him because he's got an asset. Banks have a hard time loaning money to a one-hectare farmer. The warehouse aggregator can then on-lend, either directly or through fertilizer and seed, to the small farmers. The small farmers then, when they harvest, can take part of their harvest and pay off the loan and then keep the rest in storage or sell some of it. To me, the clearest picture that I have is when I drive through Mozambique, which to a certain extent reminds me a lot of Brazil, where I'm from. You have places with very similar weather, though totally um, similar, say, patterns of soil, very similar cultures, the same language. But in one end, you see Brazil being a major exporter and considered now a breadbasket for the world, and on the other hand, you see Mozambique as a, right now, food riots and food dependent in some areas. I can totally see Mozambique being an ex-Brazil, given its own scale, in the next 10 to 20 years. There are now develops an infrastructure that will provide roads, railroads, and energy across the country. There's investments in credit and irrigation. They're providing now fields similar to Brazil into production. But most importantly, I see Mozambique actually engage with their smallholders as part of their solution. So I see a world where instead of being in the port of Mozambique in Maputo with 
food grains being shipped in, I can see food grains being exported out. So an African farmer is a woman. 80% of African farmers are women. And it's a hectare or half a hectare, an acre or two of land. It's usually, it's rain fed, there's not irrigation. You rely on the unpredictability of when the rains come. It's uh, cultivated at a very low intensity level. So if you go driving through the Midwest of, the, of America, you see a lot of very productive agriculture. In most parts of Africa, you've got much lower density of seed spacing. You have poorer seed, you don't use fertilizer. And so if you look at a field which is fully grown, it looks much more, much more scrubby, much less productive than a field in Iowa would. And it's based on manual labor. And so you'll see out in the fields during planting time and harvesting time, the whole village out there and working very hard from day up to, uh, to when the sun sets, trying to get the harvest in. It's uh, an agriculture which doesn't do much to help send your children to school or have good medicine or have any amenities in the house. It's subsistence agriculture. To make a green revolution work, to have an agricultural transformation, you're really changing a system. And part of what is different is people are starting to think of real large-scale holistic solutions um, where you not only have a fertilizer subsidy which allows people to buy fertilizer, but you also have seed systems with improved seed and you have irrigation and you've got connections to markets. Any of those done individually helps, but it doesn't help a lot because if you have seed but no water, you don't get much of a bang. All those things, four or five things put together, can have a really multiplicative effect and you get a systems benefit. And what the world is doing right now is experimenting with large-scale implementations of big systems transformations. And there's several which are worth noting. You know, there's a value chain transformations where you say all the things that need to work for a cocoa value chain or a dairy value chain, let's make sure those are in place. Or you could have, we call it a place-based transformation where you say all the things that need to work to get this state or this region of a country uh, to have an agricultural transformation, let's make sure those work. And the public sector, the private sector, social sector can all contribute to that. For instance, in Liberia, the needs for human capital, financial capital, infrastructure are so great that might overwhelm anyone on what needs to happen for have a vibrant industry going. So Liberia, one of their major pushes was, I need to bring focus. And that not only they provided on priority crops that are clearly articulated on their plans, but also need to focus on where to develop the infrastructure. So one of their ideas is, how can I invest my scarce resources on developing a connection between my port in Morovia to my areas that have the potential to be a breadbasket? And the corridor would be this integrated plan where the government articulates with the support of um, multilaterals and, and foundations where there is needed infrastructure to be developed, not only roads, but also storage, um, collection points, and by articulating that corridor from point A to point B, it helps private sector to assess where should it be putting my investments so it can benefit from this infrastructure development and bring a whole region more quickly up to production. Another part of it is thinking about who is going to be the frontline change agent. If you have you know, hundreds of millions of farmers who need to do something different in order to have a green revolution in Africa, the question is who is going to work day to day with those to get them to change. And uh, one of the examples in Morocco that we've been involved in is using nucleus farmers as a change agent. In that case, the government of Morocco invited uh, 500, uh, they provided, actually had a tender, a solicitation to ask Spanish farmers, Moroccan farmers, Moroccan business people to take up franchises to come in and provide the nucleus farm that would be the catalyst for allowing thousands of farmers in the vicinity 
to also move to more productive agriculture. So if you're farming a part of Morocco which is wheat and you know that it'd be much more uh, productive to move to tomatoes or to olives which you could export to Europe, how do you do that? And historically you would have the government have extension agents out in the field trying to get individual farmers or groups of farmers to move. And what the government of Morocco said, it's a better change process if you have a private sector change program. If we can attract a nucleus farmer who is relatively sophisticated, knows how to find markets in Europe, can bring in some investment, can show that you could move from wheat to tomato in an effective way, he could be the change agent for all the thousands of farmers in their vicinity. And so the government created a set of contracts and incentives to get the nucleus farmers attracted, to get them going in business, to build roads, to provide a lease. But in return, the nucleus farmer has agreed to be the change agent to help all the farmers around uh, the farm to also participate in this. One example of this need to think about the market is what we observe in Mozambique for the development of the poultry industry. One of the key potentials in the country is, given their soil and weather conditions, is soybean production as well as corn production. We just don't want to produce more soybeans and corn without having an outlet for that. And that realize, the, the realization of that market came from the form of a chicken. That integrated view provided the demand and the incentive for farmers to plant more of the soybeans and corn. With that symb literally symbiotic relationship, you start seeing the potential for a higher end industry to develop poultry, um, bringing along several small holders planting their own corn and soy that they use not only for their own uh, food uses, but also they know that all the excess can be consumed by a poultry processor nearby. When we see the, uh, the right incentives for farmers in Africa, we actually see a very rapid technology um, adoption. Cell phones are the most obvious one that everybody talks about. Within five years, uh, we saw uh, in Kenya uh, penetration going from virtually no cell phones to 60% of the population having cell phones or access to cell phones. And what people are realizing in Africa is that not only it can provide the mobile phones, the information that a farmer need, for price discovery, for past outbreaks, but I can actually get information back. Since labor is so cheap, if you start offering a small cents on the dollar for farmers to provide information back if an outbreak of disease is happening, if there is a need for more seeds, if there is a need to actually ship a truck, these information services now actually creates not only wealth for the provider of that information, but actually as we start to aggregate, creates so much data mining opportunities for us to assess where the diseases are coming and going, where the weather is actually providing benefits for higher production, less production, which then are creating new business models that we don't have yet in, for instance, North America. And that example of a technology leap that Africa is taking is, is capable because they have a very different structure than U.S. And that becomes very important for us. The technology cannot just be let's copy and paste what Brazil did or what Europe did or what North America did. So getting technology into the seeds for African crops is a big opportunity. The Gates Foundation and others are really funding this in a, in a big scale. Uh, there's also technology which has to do with making implements which are easier for small farmers to use. The Chinese have three-wheel tractors, which are terrific. They can be used for planting at the beginning of the season and for harvesting at the end of the season and for moving things around or for taking your family to the city. You know, these are multi-use, small vehicles, which are very appropriate for small farmers. We're also seeing an ever-increasing um, uh, commitment uh, both from the public sector and the private sector to fund agriculture in, in Africa. Um, and that has really been a dramatic turnaround since the early part of uh, uh, the last uh, decade. 
Uh, a lot of it is on the higher values, what we call higher value specialty crops, uh, crops like cocoa, coffee, uh, cotton, fruits, and so forth. We're hoping that over the next years, that commitment will also translate in the basic uh, staple uh, crops like corn, like rice, like wheat, like soy, uh, legumes, and so forth as well. The private sector is great at understanding demand. The private sector is great at giving incentives for people to work really hard and stay up nights worrying about things. The private sector is great at operating things efficiently. And to get a, get a system of agriculture moving, you're going to need all those things. But the government also has a role to play. If I think about in Ghana, you've got many large multinational companies, you've got many large private sector investors who say, I could see making money in Ghana, but I'm scared about the land laws. You know, I don't know if I go and contract to farm this set of land, whether I really have the rights to it, whether I'm going to have a problem with it. They're scared about some of the tax policies or some of the import and export policies. So the government has a great role to play to making it easier for private sector to come in and to make sure that the value that's created that a fair portion that stays in the country, either in terms of uh, uh, contractual agreements with the local population or taxes or, or clinics and hospitals. But the government is critical to creating the conditions to get private sector to come in. Some of the longer term research in seed is something donors or governments are more suited to do. Training of people and building educational skills are things that government's more likely to do. Agriculture is also a game for long-term bets. You do not develop a plantation or do not develop an infrastructure just for a one-year gain. You need to have at least a five to ten year horizon. And that entails then a long-term partnership. You are in a marriage, not in a, not in a speed date. And the challenge with this world is if one of the parties decide to forget their promises, either the government or the private sector or even the smallholder, that marriage falls through.